My name is Erin Hodson and I'm an extension entomologist in field crops at Iowa State. And I understand that the group represents a big geography kind of spread over a wide area of the U.S. And also, although many of you are have a background in agriculture, it's also my understanding that there are some that do turf and some other systems as well. So even though I will have a focus on crop systems, I think some of the concepts, the conversation can uh, spill over into a lot of different systems where insects are important. Uh, it's easy to find me online. So I have my email and my Twitter account up there and uh, any questions, follow-ups, email, Twitter, if you hashtag Amplify Together, I think that'll help connect me to some of the questions um, that you might have or commentary um, about some of the things I'm about to present. So um, I think it'll be a bit different, although I don't know some of the past webinars that you've had, but instead of trying to focus on plan for X insect, plan for Y insect, I think it'll be maybe more interesting, at least from my perspective, to talk more uh, big picture about IPM. So what today I hope to do is talk about building resilient pest management with the IPM focus. And um, I thought I'd do that today by actually taking a step back and uh, talk about the origin story for IPM and, and then transitioning to what we're doing right now and uh, what's maybe working, what's not working according to the experts. And I'll feed in some of the replies that you guys filled out for the survey questions. Um, if you had a chance to do that, I'll, I'll show the summaries there. And then um, I will move on to why I still think we need IPM, thinking about the next 20, 40 years, especially in agriculture. And then um, my thoughts on a resiliency plan. So let's get started. So way, 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 way back, hundreds of years ago, um, there were, um, subsistence farming and pests starting to uh, to take away some of the, the quality and the quantity of food that humans were trying to eat. And so uh, by accident, in a few different ways, uh, humans were able to come up with naturally derived plant insecticides, things from like chrysanthemums, uh, nicotine from tobacco, and some other uh, chemistries, some naturally derived insecticides in the 1100s. And that continued for a long time, a couple hundred years. And with the advancement of technology, we had commercial sprayers as agriculture got larger, more organized uh, sprayers that could spray these naturally derived insecticides since the 1880s. And uh, technology, chemistry, engineering has improved continuously. And we had uh, toxicologists or chemists come up with synthetically derived insecticides. So they originally came from plants, but then chemists figured it out how to create it in the lab. And that was actually in the 1930s. And that was a big game changer for the amount of insecticides that could be applied um, if, as farms grow bigger and just the reliability. So you know how much active ingredient you're putting on uh, crops. And actually, um, people learned that some of the products that were used on insects made humans sick as well. And so unfortunately, it was turned against some of us in, in uh, World War I war. Organophosphates were particularly lethal when applied as a sarin gas in World War I. So there's lethal and sublethal effects. Our nervous system is surprisingly similar to in insects. And so it's a particularly painful way to die for humans. Anyway, so uh, since World War I in the 30s, not only was insecticide, not only were insecticides used in agriculture, but they started to get used around homes. So those folks that were growing their gardens, not only um, vegetable gardens, but ornamentals as well. And then in and around the house. And this is an ad from Good Housekeeping. And it sort of makes me smile a little bit when I see something like the ladies know what's good. You know, they're using it around the house because it's odorless, but they're also using it in and around bedrooms where people sleep. Some of you may remember a time when kids would chase foggers going down the street trying to suppress mosquito populations. And with the uh, invention and a manipulation of a product DDT, um, that was something that was more commonplace, not only around the US, but around the world. And so it was a product called Did It. Uh, was something that you could buy right off the shelf. You know, you didn't need a license or anything. Um, homeowners can use it. There were some questions about, uh, you know, the safety 
and the efficacy of DDT starting in the 40s, 50s. And you started to see ads like this, DDT is good for me, and also advertisements from chemical companies showing, you know, you could eat a hot dog and have a Coke and get fogged, no problem. And so there were some questions starting to come up uh, about that um, in the 40s and 50s. And it was really a huge environmental movement uh, started by people like Rachel Carson that talked about the widespread continuous use of broad spectrum insecticides. And she wrote about some of her observations in a book called Silent Spring in 1962. She talked about a lot of prophylactic applications. So whether the pest was there or not, many treatments were going on. And she was able to document some exposure issues and bioaccumulation issues with non-target insects and also impacting other animals like birds and humans as well. And then she was also able to document the, um, the uh, once uh, application was very effective, wasn't effective anymore. So people would put more and more and more on and not see the same efficacy that they once did and documenting resistance happening in the environment. And that was also a really big game changer in agriculture as well. There's a group in California in uh, the 50s uh, that put out a publication talking about the integrated control concept. And this was uh, really to address not only the economics of the crop and also the injury potential of the pest, but using multiple strategies together to suppress pests. And from this integrated control concept, there's been a lot of research and energy dedicated to what we know today as the economic injury level and the economic threshold concepts for those persistent pests that uh, can reduce the yield or, or quality of crops. And so this is what I tend to think about. This is what IPM is today. Um, this is a graphic that's been adapted by me from a couple of entomologists uh, who literally wrote the book on economic entomology from Iowa State, Pedigo and Rice. And what they talked about is really trying to understand the pest. So things like what's its life cycle, population dynamics, you know, how many generations per year does it have, how many offspring it can produce, you know, how to properly sample the pest, some of those foundational pieces to tr try and really understand the pest so that we can interfere with its success. And then some of the longer, the bigger term things that come out from understanding a pest include um, understanding cultural control and how that could maybe help or hurt a pest. So things like data planting, row spacing, seed selection, and weed control are all things that influence how well a pest might do in a season. And some of the more uh, complicated uh, research efforts include things like using host plant resistance, interfering with the uh, reproductive potential of a pest, and then also pesticides, which is part, uh, in most cases, of a successful IPM program. So all of these things kind of put into play to try and understand the pest so that we can interfere with the pest for IPM. So that's how I think about IPM today. It's probably how many of you think about IPM is using some of those strategies to interfere with the pest. And so when I think about the current state of IPM, um, I asked you guys, uh, how do you think your clients scout for pests? And um, I just put it in a pie chart here just to simplify it. But some of you said, you know, the clients are doing it themselves. They're scouting themselves and, and maybe making some treatment decisions from that. Uh, also, a few of you said that they're depending on extension. So this is sad from my point of view that more people aren't using extension to help with time, time to scout, maybe um, places to scout, things like that. But a few of your clients are using extension. But by far, most of the time people are using crop advisors, maybe local co-ops, seed and chem dealers, that kind of thing. And if I were to do this uh, same survey in Iowa, I'd probably get a similar response. Most people are relying on other folks to help them scout for pests and rely on their expertise, not only for insects, but probably weeds and diseases and other things as well. I also asked you guys, uh, how do your clients manage pests? And so uh, I got an interesting response. A few of you said they're doing nothing. So uh, I'm unclear. I'm very curious to know, are people just planting that crop or you know, uh, dealing with it and just walking away, not scouting, not treating, whatever they get, they get? I'm not sure what that means. I'd be interested to know that maybe when we have time for questions. 
some of you said that your clients are on a prophylactic program. And to me, this means they sign up with a co-op or something like that, um, maybe a good, better, best program in which it likely includes herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. And kind of almost regardless of pest pressure, they are getting probably multiple treatments or exposures to insects uh, and insecticides every year. And then uh, just under half of you said your clients are using threshold-based treatments. So that to me means they're scouting or they're using some sort of activity density threshold and only applying when needed. So to me, this is, this is great. About half of the people are probably incorporating multiple facets of IPM gold star for me. Um, if I were to do this in Iowa, I would say that many of the uh, corn and soybean farmers are in the blue. They're using a prophylactic approach. So they're not doing too much scouting and they're on a, a pre, prepaid program and multiple applications are getting applied every year. So um, for my job, that's hard because I want people to be in the green, but most of them are in the blue. Um, when I think about what people are doing today, uh, I think that most farmers in the US are embracing genetically engineered crops. And uh, when I think about corn specifically, in Iowa, about 85%, that would include herbicide tolerance, and then in most cases, um, one or multiple BT traits for corn insects. When I think about the U.S., according to NAS, it's a little, it's it's almost the same. It's about 83% are using some sort of GE trait or genetically engineered trait on their crop. And what I think about people are doing today, generally, in my mind, farms are getting bigger, and not necessarily that the homestead is getting bigger, but they are accumulating or renting, leasing land wherever they can find it. So instead of a kind of one area from the farm, they're they're where they farm might be spread out throughout a county or multiple counties. And this presents some difficulties because it is hard to so to see what's going on with your pests if they're kind of spread all over spatially. I think there are more choices available. Uh, if a farmer wants to, they can buy from six, seven different eight, eight seed catalogs and they would have different descriptions of what's included, including pest management wise, whether they um, screen for diseases or insects, and just the actually the, the choices become overwhelming to I think a lot of people, not only with seed selection, but with um, pesticide availability as well when it comes to herbicides, fungicides and insecticides, it, you have a lot of choices for some farmers. And so because of that, I think people like the simplified program. They like the tell me, you know, based on your experience, you know, this is um, the industry's full-time job, tell me a a good, better, best prophylactic approach. You've done all the research, you tell me, um, because it is sort of overwhelming when you include all of the seed and chemical options. Um, I think a lot of farmers are interested in using insecticidal seed treatments. And when it comes to corn, about 95% of, of corn in the US has an insecticide treatment and about 50% of the soybeans. And that number would probably jump up a little bit for soybean if you thought about um, what people are doing for fungicides, but when it comes to insecticides, it's about 50%. I think the increasing adoption is partly due to the relatively low cost. Um, and sometimes you get a bundle, you know, a discount if you're doing multiple uh, treatments at one time. It's a relatively reduced active ingredient per acre compared to if they were doing in furrow or a foliar application, and it's just the ease of planting. They can get it all done at once instead of going through the field multiple times. So there's some efficiencies that go along with the seed treatment. And for some, they believe they're getting targeted pest activity to seed and seedling pests. So there's that protection, early season protection, when they may or may not be able to scout all those fields, especially if they're spread uh, all over the place. When I think about specifically neonicotinoids, which is the most common active ingredient for seed treatments. Most of the applications are going on in corn, and then uh, second would be soybean. And then after that, it really drops off to other crops. Um, so most of the neonics that people are using in the US are in corn or soybean. So I think about, okay, the current state of IPM. Um, of course, it's evolved many, many times since that paper uh, integrated control concept paper came out. And if you look in, in the literature, um, we have over 65 different definitions. So you can imagine 
an IPM definition would look very different in traditional field crops versus something that's maybe more high, high value crop like fruit or vegetable or even things like mosquito control um, or around schools and, and urban areas. The How people are using IPM varies greatly. And so the definition has, has naturally evolved many, many times since then. And I think will continue to evolve. But when I look at the literature, most of the time their definitions are based on inputs. What are we doing? What tactics are we recommending to help suppress pests and protect crops or people or other things? So usually it involves inputs like regular scouting. Sometimes it includes natural enemies. Uh, sometimes it involves uh, competition from other pests. But in most cases, people are talking about layering or um, using multiple suppressive tactics. So you're doing multiple things at once to try and get the best overall suppression of the pest. In some cases, when it comes to peel crops or fruit and veg, uh, they think about using treatment thresholds or economic thresholds. You know, it takes so many pests to either reduce yield or reduce quality before action is needed. So that's also pretty common in the agricultural world. And then in some cases, when you have a very sophisticated high value crops, you can um, think about the control or suppression with multiple pests at the same time. And so that's also uh, how I think about how people are defining IPM right now is based on inputs. And I can think of two big examples of where IPM has worked for a very long time. And what I would describe as community level successes. And the first one, if you're familiar with pink bollworm and cotton, uh, there's a paper that came out 10 years ago that said, basically because of the high adoption rate of BT in combination with the high refuge compliance, so that's that was cotton pl planted without BT, in addition to a layered strategy where they released sterile males, it has delayed the, uh, the uh, a delayed the acquisition of CRY1AC, which is a BT trait resistant in the population. So high adoption plus refuge plus sterile insect technique has uh, really reduced the overall population of pink bollworm and cotton and protected that crop for a very long time on a community or big landscape level. One that is a little bit closer to home for me would be European corn borer and corn. At the same time, a paper came out about 10 years ago that talked about the very high adoption rate of BT, basically in the Midwest, uh, in combination with a mandatory refuge compliance, so that was non-BT corn planted, uh, had an area-wide suppression of European corn borer. So that, in fact, it was such a high success level that even folks that were not growing BT benefited from this because the overall population of corn borers was dramatically tamped down and it was hard to find corn borers in some situations. So it's delaying the uh, it's delaying the resistance in the population to several BT traits. Um, I don't know how far east some of you folks might come from, but you may have heard about Cry1F resistance for European corn borer developing for, uh, for the Z race in Canada. Um, it is not the, the, the big race that we have for the majority of the Midwest and the U.S., but um, it is becoming an issue for some. So um, it's a combination of uh, BT, and what they've done in this case is they've stacked multiple BT genes together, and it is really slowing down the resistance. So 20-plus years, um, this, this uh, strategy has been really effective for corn borers. And so uh, you also may be familiar with the National IPM Roadmap, and they came out with a revision in 2018 that really shifted the, the mindset from what are we doing, inputs, strategies, tactics, to outputs. And so they really spent a lot of time in this roadmap talking about minimizing risk to the economy and health and environment. They talked about wanting to incorporate more research into science-based decision-making. And then they also spent a lot of time talking about combine, combining tools. Um, so they did spend some time thinking about in inputs, but basically they want to be able to measure the success of learning and adoption of IPM. So they spent more time thinking about the so what. So what are we doing and does it even matter? And so you'd be able to, to read that very long document of IPM roadmap that came out two years ago. And so it looks all good. You know, I, I'm okay with changing my mindset and thinking about outputs 
and I have to do that for uh, my job as well. Not only document the inputs, but the outputs. Answer the so what, does anybody, does anybody care, or is anybody uh, using some of the things I recommend? So it looked all good. I was very excited, but then I also read this article in the American Entomologist that said, whatever happened to IPM? And they were pretty negative and talked about most, most farmers are not using IPM. They are using a prophylactic approach. You know, the, the concept of being uh, multiple strategies was out the door. And these are also entomologists that, that at some point had some time at Iowa State. And they were they they really wanted to think of change change the mindset again to outputs and um, think about how are we changing our philosophy about IPM and how do we document the success. So they were pretty negative about the current state of IPM. So that's that's sad for me because again, that's my whole program. At the same time, 2008 was kind of a bummer year for me because another paper came out in Science that talked about uh, insects are uh, wicked and, and um, basically uh, the, that uh, they develop resistance to some of the strategies that we have uh, consistently used for the last 50, 60 years and they overcome it faster than uh, entomologists toxicologists, engineers can uh, produce new tactics. And so they accumulate very, uh, very fast resistance. And they estimated that pesticide resistance causes uh, or costs US about $10 billion a year. So it's a very expensive industry. And when insects can overcome strategies faster than we can develop them, they called it a, a wicked problem. And it's, and it's sort of on the human side. You know, we can develop strategies, but then we end up burning out of them faster than we can create them and implement them. What they showed in that paper was basically because of the insect biology, many of them have multiple generations per year. And so they can outcompete, you know, faster than scientists can develop strategies. And that say, for example, if an insect can develop resistance to something like pyrethroid, it's often a dominant gene and they'll pass that on to their offspring right away. So you can go from a susceptible population to a resistant population in a very short time. And so they've documented that with a couple of, of key pests. And then they've also, uh, in another paper, described nearly 600 insects or arthropods have developed resistance to something, whether it's an insecticide or a trait, um, that, that number has increasing almost exponentially now uh, because of the exposure and just the, the dominant way insects pass on those genes. Two big uh, wicked failures that I can think about when it comes to agriculture would be Colorado potato beetle. Uh, it's a potato industry is very huge, um, not only in the United States, but other places. Everyone likes fries and chips, right? So um, unfortunately, they have had so much exposure and they're so, uh, they, they're so adaptive that they're at least resistant to 54 active ingredients. And, and you know, there's not that many insecticides, that many active ingredients in the world and they have become resistant to almost everything that they're using which is unfortunate because then you can imagine trying new chemistries are always more expensive and um, there's only so much cultural control you can do for something like potatoes the second one is is a little bit closer to my world including western corn rootworm um, it is a pest that's only been in really the the corn belt for 50 or 60 years they have a one generation per year so that's only 50 or 60 generations that they've been in the corn belt, but even in that short amount of time, they have become too res resistant to multiple insecticides. They have become resistant to the only four BT cry proteins we have available. And uh, some of them have also become resistant to crop rotation. So some of the, the big tactics that we use and have been successful for other pests don't work for a Western corn rootworm, and it's really frustrating and very expensive to try and grow uh, a successful clean crop. There's many more examples out there, uh, but those are some, two of the ones that I think about that are wicked. And probably whatever strategy we develop in the future, they will overcome. It's just a matter of time. So uh, again, I want to go back to some of the surveys that some of the questions I asked you in the survey. And I asked you to estimate the IPM understanding of your clients, of their knowledge of IPM. And so I said, low, medium, high. And your response, uh, you said your clients have sort of a medium knowledge. They probably understand some of the tools that people are using for IPM. They probably understand the 
the concept of using a threshold. You have to have so much activity before a treatment becomes profitable, you know, profit loss. They probably understand that. There was a few on the low and one on the high side. So that is probably pretty standard, no matter where you go. If they're farming or they're involved with pest management, they have sort of a medium understanding. I also asked uh, about your client's interest in IPM. That might be trying to learn more about how the research is done, more about implementation, some of the, the snags to uh, implementing IPM. And again, most of you said your clients are sort of in the middle, middle interest. Um, and more on the low side, one on the high side again. And um, you know, this is where in, in my world, I want to push people to the high. I want high knowledge, I want high interest, but this is probably pretty standard for a farmer or client audience. And then I also asked about adoption. How interested are your clients in adopting IPM? And this is kind of like where I have the sad face um, because uh, this is also representative of Iowa. Um, they may have heard about it, they may be interested in, in knowing more about it, but are they willing to implement it? And this is where the real snag comes in, is scouting, using thresholds, mixing up the chemistries that they're using. They're not as interested in doing that, whether it's because they've tried before and failed or they just don't see it as profitable. I'm not sure what some of the barriers are, but this is where you know documenting the success or the outputs of IPM, I really struggle. And, and maybe some of you do too with um, getting people to try new things and backing off from the prophylactic approach. So um, I just want to transition thinking about the future. You know, the next 60 years of agriculture, how are we going to um, think about pest management and, and especially integrated pest management um, in an agriculture mindset? And so I almost think about, you know, how like fashion, music, food kind of cycles every couple of generations. I also think IPM is a bit back to the future. And sometimes we just need to actually step back and think about what are some big picture strategies that worked in the past and can we use them for uh, thinking about pests that are happening right now or maybe some pests that we anticipate in the future. So um, what I think about for the next couple of years, also in 2008, it's a super, it was a disappointing year for me um, at WorkWise in which uh, you may have heard about the federal climate change report. And um, what they said is basically, the world can expect warmer, wetter human conditions, which you might think, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. Warm and wet, crops like heat, they like water, um, but it's not going to be like a constant amount. It's going to be more dramatic events. So high years, low years, very intense years where you have all or nothing. And basically they also said that the Midwest is going to be impacted the most. And it is very challenging to have a farm where you don't know what to expect. High years, low years, really hot years, co you know, colder than normal years. It's really hard to predict how plants will grow and then how those insects might respond. But in general, diseases and insects are, um, are do better in those years where it's warm and wet. So we can expect more pest pressure, not only from the insect side, but maybe diseases too. And that's hopefully that makes sense when you think about like the disease triangle. And then I also think about does, um, decreases in grain quality when you have wet grain. Iowa is experiencing that now. Maybe some of you or your clients are as well if you're trying to harvest wet grain, you know, the trying to keep the quality up through the winter uh, as you go into storage is expensive and an issue as well. And I think we're gonna have to deal with more and more of that grain quality issues, keeping that up high and, um, um, when we try and sell it. I also was looking at the USDA for seed and seed costs and yield for the US heartland. And there's that you can look this up for like a 20 year span for the heartland for soybean. And that solid line represents seed costs over that 20 year span. And that's probably not a surprise to anybody that seed costs are going up. So just getting the crop in the ground is more expensive. Um, what I don't like to see is looking at the yield trend for soybean over that same period, which is the dash line. And while it's not flat, it's almost flat. And so uh, what you wanna see ideally is the slope to be the same. Seed costs are going up, but okay, so is yield, um, but it's not happening. In 2008, 
that line crossed and it's never gone back. And so you can imagine uh, as those those lines get further and further apart, the profit margin um, gets thinner and thinner. And so they have to put more into the crop and not necessarily getting that back with the market value. So that um, forces them to make, forces farmers to make decisions about, okay, well then what else am I gonna cut back on? Am I cutting back on scouting? Am I cutting back on other things? At the same time, I look at market values and you see uh, soybean in the green. And as you would expect, numbers go up and down, they fluctuate. And uh, when the numbers aren't great, like they have been for the last couple of years, that profit margin becomes really thin. So that's what you know, farmers have to think about trimming out um, other things so that they hope hopefully can make a profit. Uh, I think uh, farmers expect to work marginal land. And so when the profit margins are down, they are thinking about converting CRP pastures, other marginal land, wet spots, uh, for example, into land to try and recover some of those costs. You may or may not know that Iowa is the most disturbed state in the US, maybe for a couple of reasons. But in this case, it's most disturbed because 85% of our state is has been transitioned into cropland. So it looks very different than when the, the, the areas first settled. And so because of that, 85% is not all super awesome farmland. You know, there is a lot of marginal land that comes with that. And there was a study done uh, a couple of years ago that showed no matter what people are doing, five to 20% of the crop is unprofitable. So they could be putting a ton of inputs, trying to tile, fertilize, you know, they do all everything that they can to try and grow a crop. And there are others that just basically plant and walk away and whatever they get, they get. So there's sort of a range on inputs there, but five to 20% is never profitable. And that's sort of, it's, it's disturbing because they, you know, farmers are, trying to do everything that they can to keep the farm alive. In some cases, um, some of that marginal land is never gonna uh, work for that farmer. I also think about um, what's new. And when it comes to invasive insects, I could have typed probably five or six pages, a long list of what they would consider invertebrates. So insects, mites, spiders, snakes, you know, there's a whole bunch of different animals in that group. And some of these may be closer to home than others, but I could have just went on page after page after page. Insects that are coming from other parts of the world and sometimes have a really dramatic effect on our agriculture, trees, fruits, other things like that. And that is going to be forever now. Um, there's always going to be the latest list of invasive species coming into the States. And then I had a couple of examples of resistant pests and that number is only increasing. Those wicked problems of uh, pests that were once controlled that are no longer controlled, that number is going to increase and increase. So you have that constant pressure of always thinking about something new. And so uh, this last part here is my resiliency plan. I was kind of bummed out about some of the news in 2018 about some of the, the um, climate, ch climate change um, and some of the um, resistant wicked problems happening. And, you know, it seems like maybe we could never keep, keep up. And so I'm trying to trying to put a positive spin here to wrap it up by thinking about a resiliency plan. And as I look up the definition, it said um, either was capable of withstanding shock without permanent deformation or tending to recover from or re adjust to misfortune or change. And I probably couldn't describe a farmer better than that. You know, every season is different. Even fields that are side by side could have a totally different experience. And um, they have to constantly adjust to misfortune and change. The seed catalog they had last year, it's going to look different this year. They're not going to have all the same options they had. And so EPA, they phase in and phase out different chemistries, different uh, options for management. And so it does become complicated very quickly and a farmer has to be resilient. And so this last question that I asked you is how are we going to manage pests in 20 years? I was surprised and uh, pleasantly surprised. And you guys are optimistic. None of you said, we won't be able to manage pests in 20 years. And um, maybe that's just the, the pessimistic side of me. 13% um, of you said we haven't invented it yet. So that gives me, um, I'm curious, but I'm also optimistic that someone is gonna come up with a novel suppression or, or management strategy. So, and I do believe that that, that will happen for pest management. Uh, let's see, 20, almost 20% of you said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 20 of you said um, insecticides are going to be part of what we do to manage pests, and I also agree. 
And then um, also surprisingly, um, hold on just a second. I apologize, my dog uh, heard something exciting in the front yard. Um, I was surprised by the number of people, 20% of you said uh, that host plant resistance is going to be part of how we manage pests in the future. And that is not very common in my world. Maybe in some of the, if you have more diverse crops, maybe you guys have access to strong breeding programs in which uh, the, the plant naturally defends itself. And so I think that's fantastic. That gives me some hope. Um, and then you had some other things like predators, pathogens, some cultural control. I do think it will be a mix. And so you guys responded um, and gave me, gave me a little bit of hope and I appreciate you guys for, for uh, filling out those questions. Okay, so uh, my goal is it's gonna be a combination for me. I'm gonna continue to work on the inputs on, on strategies for managing pests um, and things I, I, I spent quite a bit of time talking about today. One thing, I didn't really talk about was developing thresholds and that's part of my research program is for those pests that are there I know they reduce yield how can I provide those cutoffs where I know what if you apply a treatment at this time you're very likely to make a profit um, but what I think uh, myself and others are doing are interested in using dynamic thresholds so based on the market value and control costs you could imagine a threshold going up or down as opposed to static, which is what most of the thresholds are. So taking into account more of the economics of the pest. And then also site-specific strategies. So you can imagine for some of those really large fields, the pests generally aren't uniform. And in my experience, most pests are aggregated around field edge contrast. So instead of treating a 200 acre field, could we treat 10 acres as a perimeter treatment? So I think uh, as spray technology improves, we would be able to do more site-specific treatments for hotspots. I also have to be able to think about outputs. How do I measure success and how do I measure adoption? And so that's why you see many of us in extension and academia pestering people about, are you learning, are you adopting? Because we have to, at the end of the day, show that we're changing some of those outputs. Uh, when I think about a resilient crop system, we're doing multiple things to suppress pests. Uh, I, we have to be able to tolerate some pests, which is hard for some farmers and, and because they've been um, burnt in the past and it's just hard to see some of that, that yield or, or quality decrease. Um, but it is something that I think we're gonna have to learn to live with. And also finding tactics to mitigate risk. So we're doing everything that we can to uh, minimize the risk, knowing that the weather, climate, and some of the other things I talked about are uncertain. And then just um, strive for community sustainability. So this is the hard part, because farmers like to hold their, what they perceive as failures or missteps kind of close to the vest, and not necessarily uh, broadcast that around. But um, I think the more that I get farmers talking to each other about what worked and maybe what didn't work, that's where I feel like we're going to get some of the uh, landscape, um, the bigger improvements instead of just an ind individual farm having a success. And so um, my, in addition to working with some of the dynamic thresholds, some things I want farmers to think about when it comes to pest management is profit margins. And so this is, I think, some, something that, that farmers are doing on return of investment when they're thinking about inputs and market values and things like that. But most farmers that I talk to, their goal is so many bushels per acre. That's what they talk about. I had a good year. I had 180 bushels of corn instead of I made X dollars per acre. So they're, they're thinking more about the yield and, and not the profit. So I'm hoping to change some mindsets and I'll give you just one example of how I'm thinking about return on investment. My most recent graduate student uh, was, was thinking about these profit margins and, and really putting together these budget sheets for soybean in Iowa. She created, I don't know how many scenarios, probably different, 50 different scenarios. And I just wanna show you three as kind of an example. So she built a budget for what I would call most common setup for soybean in Iowa. It's herb herbicide tolerant soybean and um, the genetics would be susceptible to soybean aphid. And that's, I think, you know, 99.99% of what people are doing. And so she built a, a typical budget here. And of course, it could get a lot more complicated and she had more complex versions. But um, most of the time, it would include an insecticide application. 
um, whether it was needed or not. There's usually kind of one that goes on uh, around uh, right after bloom. And so that's about uh, just under $18. So the overall cost for this very simple budget is $468. Now in Northern Iowa, we can have a range of yield potential, 50, 60, 70. We, I, put a couple, I put three different market values, kind of um, what's happening right now and maybe some more deal times. But if I give an example, say uh, 60 bushels at $8 a bushel, the, the profit is, is, you know, it's just under $12. So I think that standard, that's what farmers are doing. And um, they might be happy with that $12 profit. Uh, what is happening for some farmers is that uh, some of the populations of soybean aphid are developing resistance to pyrethroids. And so the cheap, easy, once bulletproof strategy no longer works. And so, of course, when you ask a farmer to, to switch up the chemistries, instead of using something that's cheap and generic, now they have to use something that is more expensive. So it's the same budget, except the insecticide application has almost doubled. So you can imagine the input is great, greater, and as a result, the profit margin for that same scenario now is at a slight loss. And so this is what some farmers are experiencing is that kind of razor thin profit margin uh, where now the alternative is causing them to, to lose yield. Now, uh, a few moments ago when, when I heard that some of you think maybe host plant resistance is a tool for the future. I get very excited about that because I've been working on host plant resistance for soybean aphid for maybe 15 years. And it is a fantastic level of control to a point where if you use that genetics, you will not get an outbreak of soybean aphid. It has never been shown in 15 years. And the need for an insecticide, at least for the aphids is not needed. So in this scenario, you've taken out that cost. And so as you would imagine, the profit margin goes way up. So you, um, this is something I want farmers to think about is the costs and the benefits to spraying and not spraying. And then also maybe thinking about mixing up what they're spraying and the control costs associated with that. So just kind of one quick example of how I'm thinking about return on investment for farmers, not necessarily bushels per acre, but dollars per bushel or dollars per acre, sorry. So I know that uh, I can, I seem to keep attracting funding, training students. These students are very innovative when it comes to generating some new tools, especially for some site specific tools. So I'm excited about that and excited to think about how we might manage pests in 2040. And I think as we can get uh, advanced with new active ingredients that are site specific, we can advance the spray technology to even further reduce some of those input costs that profit margin I hope will, will in, continue to increase. And then I think about the barriers, you know, I, we can develop the tools. I know that host plant resistance is awesome, but it's not being used by farmers. And part of the problem is that it's not in any seed catalogs that people can use. So of course they don't even have the option to use it. Why the host plant resistance isn't in seed catalogs is a whole other discussion. But um, you know we can develop all the tools in the world, but um, if they're not available and people don't use them, um, those are some big barriers to IPM adoption. So just wrapping up here, I think about the resilient pest management. I have to understand some of those wicked problems. And a lot of times it comes down to social. Um, how are the people I interact with, farmers, crop consultants, using that or not using uh, that research-based information? And it's gonna take expanding the toolbox. I wanna think about focusing on some of the outputs, on measuring some of the successes of IPM. And then I'm going to do that by using some of the dynamic thresholds and models for return on investment. So um, this is my team. And all we do, almost everything we do is uh, centered on integrated pest management. Most of it is in soybean. Some of it's in crops, um, podcasts, YouTube videos, blogs, tweets. I kind of do it all just trying to get the word out there. But again, there's my at my uh, Twitter handle, and I think the hashtag will uh, work out nicely. If you have questions that go beyond today, I'm happy to answer questions um, after you digest and maybe uh, think about some of the concepts I brought up. And so I think with that, I am going to turn off, oops, I'm going to turn off my screen share, and hopefully it's just me again. Um, I see there's a few people still hanging on. I appreciate that. I'm wondering if you have any questions for me or comments, 
anything like that. <laughs> sorry about the dogs. <laughs> I am sorry, Nico. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Aaron today? Okay, perfect. Well, uh, Aaron, we will get this published and we will let people come directly to you if they have questions. I appreciate you joining today. The ones who logged in, I appreciate it as well. If you watch the rewatch of this, uh, thanks for watching and hope everybody has a great day. Thank you.